Bestwood, a small town between Nottingham and Derby, is a coal and iron mining area. Black pits blight the once sweet rural countryside, where living conditions among the working classes are notoriously awful. This is where Gertrude Morell lives. She was born into a distinguished Puritan family, yet has committed the most fateful error of her life by marrying the uneducated collier Walter Morell. Initially, she was fascinated by his sensuous and jolly character, but soon discovered its flip side. He lives on debt, is a swindler, drunkard, and womanizer. Their married bliss lasts but a few months. Slowly, Gertrude begins to feel disgusted with her life choices, and after a time, she ceases to care for Morell at all, and he becomes an outsider for her. Her firstborn William is followed by Annie and eventually Paul. Gertrude lives for her children alone, becoming increasingly alienated from herself and her former dreams. She finds peace and contentment at night, alone in the garden in front of their humble home. Walter, an early bird, is mostly even-spirited and peaceful in the morning, yet he doesn't know how to show his feelings for the family or be helpful. That makes him both unhappy and aggressive. He drowns his frustration in alcohol, failing to assert his authority as husband and father, which makes him even more irritable and resentful. Moreover, he is jealous of the clergyman Mr. Heaton, with whom his wife has hours-long cultivated conversations. The whole family suffers from this atmosphere of powerlessness and alienation. Each of them is happier alone. Together, they make each other's lives hell. Mrs. Morell and her sons. Paul is an unusual baby. He is born with knitted brows and heavy eyes, as if something had terrified him even before he saw the light of day. Gertrude will love this child even more than the others, precisely because she hasn't wanted it in the first place, and she feels guilty about it. Hoping that a great future is in store for him, she holds the infant towards the setting sun performing a symbolical baptism of fire. Against her gnawing loneliness, she seeks solace from William, who is torn between conflicting emotions. Eventually, the adolescent boy sides with her against Walter, undermining his father's authority as head of the family. Yet the collier keeps on raging and rampaging. One day he threatens to run away, only to return that same night. Another day he injures his wife in a drunken stupor. Eventually, Walter falls seriously ill with an inflammation of the brain. Gertrude nurses him out of a sense of duty and fear of destitution, knowing full well that there is nothing left of her love for him. Still, some time after Walter's illness, Arthur is born, fruit of this temporary truce between the spouses. While Paul grows into a delicate and melancholic boy, William evolves into a vigorous young man. He is intelligent and an excellent student, quick-tempered, a dancer and heartthrob like his father. Mrs. Morell is jealous of his floozies, while he yearns for his mother's attention and approval. After a while, William loses weight, and with it, his cheerfulness. He goes to London and is doing quite well. But pretty soon, he stops sending any money, much to his mother's chagrin. He lives in style and hooks up with women who take advantage of him. Paul, on the other hand, takes after his mother, and after William's departure, grows ever closer to her. He adores her, feeling affection, pain, and guilt at the same time, along with a sense of disempowerment. It's highly confusing. When Paul is sick, his mother sleeps with him in the same bed. She chooses him as a friend, thus making her firstborn jealous. Meanwhile, in London, William has become a snob. He begins to turn his back on his modest family background, and this worries Gertrude. She fears that he won't live up to his potential. She shares her concern with Paul, who is beginning to feel like the important man of the house. He is extremely sensitive. The unfamiliar daunts him. He thinks that he's constantly under observation and evaluation. He loves painting, but in order to make money he has to take up a trade, and is indifferent to what it might be. In an ideal future, after his father's passing, he would like to live with his mother, dedicating himself to art and a quiet existence. Paul finds a position with a manufacturer of surgical appliances in Nottingham. Annie becomes a junior teacher, and the handsome but quick-tempered Arthur wins a scholarship to grammar school, going off to live with Gertrude's sister in town. All the children have become utterly disgusted with their aging and increasingly degenerate father. 
Out of hurt and spite, the old man turns even more offensive, which makes them loathe him more. One day, William introduces his newly betrothed, a dim and simple girl who acts all posh at the Morell's house and expects to be waited on by everyone. William despises her for being foolish and empty-headed, yet he seems caught in a dead-end love-hate relationship with her. It drives a wedge between him and his mother. She wants to save him from a loveless marriage such as hers, while also demonstrating her intelligence and conversation skills to her son. Premonitions of death haunt William, who soon falls ill with pneumonia and erysipelas, a rare skin disease. Gertrude Herr, S to London, but too late. She brings back a dead son. In her grief, she shuts herself off from everybody for three long months. Then Paul contracts pneumonia. Her sense of guilt brings Gertrude back to life. Now she lavishes all her remaining attention on Paul. Mother and son save each other. Henceforth, they are more deeply connected than ever before. Between motherly and girly love, Paul gets to know Miriam Leavers on a local farm. She doesn't want to be a swine girl for the rest of her life, but rather open herself to the world through education. Together, they read and discuss books, while Paul is teaching her French. The local library becomes their favorite meeting place. The pubescent Paul is fascinated by how emotional and entirely detached her family is from worldly affairs, seeming to imbue everything with some deep religious meaning, a stark contrast to his mother's rationality. A purely spiritual exchange and reflection of nature nurtures Paul and Miriam's love, which slowly becomes complicated. They end up being tender and rough, passionate and hateful to each other, a true emotional roller coaster. When Miriam shows him a wild rose bush, they are closer to each other than ever before. Miriam is ecstatic in her worship, but her parted lips and dark eyes rouse something different in Paul. He says goodnight and runs all the way home. His mother is waiting for him, constantly fretting in her jealousy. He is happiest when he can sit with his mother at night, painting. One night, when Miriam sees Paul stand out in the rich and golden evening sunlight, she has a revelation. She admits that she loves him and that her body aches for him. She even starts dreaming of him. But she swiftly inflates her desires into something mystical and religious. Paul, too, yearns for physical love, but Miriam only grants him mental and spiritual satisfaction. He feels rejected and incomplete, becoming increasingly frustrated and abusive towards her. When the moment arrives to exchange their first lover's kiss, he shrinks from her in fear, anger, and shame. Moreover, his mother hates Miriam with a passion, and this throws Paul into yet another dilemma. In the end, all three of them despise one another. Is it carnal love? For the first time, Paul exhibits some of his paintings and wins prizes for them. Paul's success gives his mother a sense of fulfillment, and Paul, in turn, dedicates all his art to her. In the factory, he is promoted to being an overseer, making progressively more money. Simultaneously, he studies textile design. Miriam introduces Clara Dawes to him, immediately recognizing the effect she has on Paul's masculinity. Clara is a suffragette, and she lives separated from her husband. She is Miriam's complete opposite. While the younger one meekly lowers her head, the older of the two stands proud. Paul continues to struggle with the cerebral nature of his relationship with Miriam, and he can't figure out the confusing signals she is sending. Sometimes he dreams of marriage and a bourgeois life with her, but he remains unconvinced. Gradually, they realize that they might not be meant for each other after all, which makes them infinitely sad. The only significant other in Paul's life is his mother. Their reconciliation has an erotic touch, but Paul also realizes that his mother has grown older and more frail. Having returned to her makes him feel at ease and trapped at the same time. In a way, he is fighting against both women, Miriam and his mother. On the one hand, he tells his mother he'll never marry and stay with her forever. On the other, he can't wait to break free and start his own life like his siblings, Annie and Arthur. Miriam is willing to wait until Paul's mother will release him from her tight grip, and Paul will have quenched his desire for Clara. Just like the other men in his family, Paul loses himself in frivolous activities. Unlike Miriam, he sees Clara as a tantalizing sexual being. He courts her, although she often rubs him the wrong way. 
In a letter to Miriam, he calls her a nun and points to the inherent flaw in their relationship. Her quest for immortal, spiritual love is irreconcilable with mortal and commonplace affections. He decides to follow his own sex drive. Miriam hesitates. Her whole body clenches at the idea of physical love. Paul frightens her when he is reduced to fits of passionate desire, and when she tries to look into his eyes, he cannot withstand her gaze. Eventually, she decides to sacrifice herself for the sake of their love and sleeps with him. But Paul realizes that she can only bear it by escaping into a religious sphere, remaining entirely absent from the act. She tells him that she wouldn't mind it as much if they were married, yet also claims that, at 24 and 23, they are still too young to do so. Her distress makes Paul feel like a brute. He realizes that the whole thing has been a failure, and he stops asking her to have him. Eventually, he leaves Miriam altogether. A Mighty Desire Paul gets Clara a job at the factory where he works. Being with and without her makes him mad with frustration and desire. The two of them constantly bicker and fight in order to conceal their mutual affection. Paul still thinks that his soul belongs to Miriam, so he tries to separate sexual desire from everyday interactions with women. Clara tell, as him that he's being unfair to Miriam, and that he simply doesn't get her true needs and desires. But Paul is also very selfish towards Clara. He doesn't appreciate the social price that she, as a married woman, has to pay for being involved with him. Basically, he doesn't care about her perspective on the matter. Miriam and even his mother both appeal to his conscience, but in vain. Leaving her husband, Clara did what Paul's mother never managed to do, and that earned her some respect with Mrs. Morell. The latter is also relieved that Miriam seems to be out of the picture, yet doesn't quite think of Clara as a suitable match for her son, either. She frightens Clara, and in the end the mother wins their mute duel over Paul. Paul and Clara experience a passionate adventure near a rapid stream. Paul mounts a steep bank of red clay and throws down his rainproof on the damp leaves between two beech trees, more or less out of sight from a group of fishermen. Then he waves for Clara to come over. Panting and kissing passionately, Paul gives Clara a forceful love bite. Later, while walking her to the train station after a visit to his house, he tells her that he wants to remain friends with Miriam, even if there's nothing physical going on between them. Clara recoils from him, feeling distant and disappointed, which in turn enrages Paul. He turns cruel and ugly against her, grabbing her violently and telling her in a husky voice that she's going to miss her train anyway. Now Clara is afraid, alone with Paul on this dark, lonely path. When she hears the rattling of the train in the distance, she makes a run for it and catches it in the nick of time, but soon they reconcile again. Together, they go to watch a stage play starring the famous Sarah Bernhardt. Clara, wearing a tight green dress, tortures him with her beauty. Bending down, he kisses her hand and wrist, and all through the performance, he can think of nothing but her beautiful body. In the end, he tells her he loves her. Having missed the last train, he spends the night at Clara's, who lives with her cantankerous mother. When, after much ado and many a game of cards, the old woman finally goes to bed, he finds Clara downstairs, kneeling naked in front of the fireplace, warming herself. He caresses her body, holding her tight, adoring her. His tenderness heals her and she feels whole again. Hot blood waves up in him again. He wants to have sex with her in his room, with the mother next door. But Clara refuses. Paul goes to bed alone without understanding and swiftly falls asleep. The mother's passing Clara's husband, Baxter Dawes, begins to stalk Paul. The two of them get into a pub fight, and Baxter threatens Paul at work. As a result, Dawes is fired and summoned to court for assault. The affair is now as public as it can get. Clara tells Paul that she doesn't love her ex, but that she doesn't want to divorce him either. She feels that Baxter at least gave her everything of him, while Paul just offers part of himself. One night, Baxter beats up Paul, but he can't talk about such humiliations with his mother. His sex life is a taboo between them. Suddenly, their mutual bond seems too tight. He feels blocked and inhibited. It dawns on him that he'll never find the right woman as long as his mother lives, and as if reading his dark thoughts, she falls ill with a tumor. 
Clara loves Paul passionately, but she feels that she gets shortchanged in their relationship. He doesn't seem to love her as a person, but merely the idea of her as something sensuous and feminine. On the one hand, she wants to hold on tight to their moments together. On the other, she knows that as a married woman, she will never have him all to herself. After a while, the initial fiery passion between them wanes. Their lovemaking becomes more mechanical and uneventful. In search of a way to rekindle the flame, they end up having furtive sex in public spaces. Meanwhile, Paul is losing himself in endless soul-searching. Although it is him who withdraws from Clara, he urges her to get a divorce. But Clara refuses. From her point of view, Baxter offers a kind of consistency that Paul entirely lacks. Paul's mother suffers horribly from her illness for many long months. It is as if she can't let go, no matter how much her body fails her. Paul can't stand the pointless agony. He gives her a strong dose of morphine to drink. The next day, she dies. Paul starts a new life. Paul befriends Baxter, who has fallen ill with typhus and is in hospital, brooding. At the same time, Clara and Paul's relationship is coming to an end. Their passion is spent, and Clara can't help with his mourning for his mother. He thinks that she can't deal with his broken self. So she returns to Baxter, who has lost weight, becomes handsome again, and emerges from his illness somewhat reformed. Paul and Walter Morell dissolve their household. Henceforth, Paul rents a small place in Nottingham, abandoning himself to his grief. He is unable to paint, and he doesn't even notice how the weeks and months go by. He is pondering the meaning of it all. His mother is dead, but he's alive. Why? To make her immortal through his own being? Thus oscillating between death and life, he goes to church one evening, where he runs into Miriam. It turns out that she will soon be making her own live, G as a teacher. To Paul, she seems to have aged prematurely, a stiff and almost wooden creature. Despite the fact that she disagrees with him on many things, she suggests they get married, if only so he doesn't continue to waste himself. He refuses, knowing that she would smother him to death. Then he asks her if they couldn't possibly have a relationship outside of marriage. This Miriam isn't willing to do, and she leaves him for good, resenting him for having refused her sacrifice. Again, he feels tiny and insignificant, whimpering for his mother. Then he pulls himself together and walks away from the darkness towards the golden glow of the city.